Hey everybody, welcome. My name is Caleb, and this is the second video on Alio and Leo. This video is going to primarily focus on the Leo programming language. So if you want the foundation of what Alio is and introduction to zero knowledge proofs, you can check out my previous video. This one's going to assume you already have Leo installed and you can already start building Leo applications. So a really quick intro on the Leo programming language. It's a high level programming language that compiles down to low level Alio instructions. In the docs, there are various examples that you can go through to get more information. We're gonna go through some of those in this lesson as well. To get started, you can get your Leo version with Leo dash dash version. And you want to make sure you're on the most up-to-date version if possible. So you can say Leo update. And you can see now I am on Leo 1.10.0. So if yours is a different version, you know, some of this content could be a little different, but you should be able to follow along with the general principles and overall understand the Leo programming language. So to get started, we can use the Leo command to do various things. And a great way to get started is to start with one of the example projects. So we can say Leo example, and then token is one of the examples. And it creates an Leo program token, and it will give you a readme on how to run it but what we will do is we will change directory into token. And then you can work with this example from this terminal or what I'm going to do is actually open it in a text editor. And then once I have the text editor open, just open a new terminal. Now there is an extension for the Leo programming language. So you can go to your extensions and search Leo. And here's the official VS code extension for Leo. This stuff's constantly being updated and worked on, so the versions you're using for Leo and the extension might be a little bit different, and that's okay. What we'll do is we'll take a look at this example. The main code that we are concerned about is in source main.leo. Here's where you will write your code. And let's go through here looking at some of the main pieces. First off, everything is surrounded in a program. So here's the open curly brace, and it goes all the way down to the bottom right here. Inside of here, you have various functions that will do things and we'll go through some of the main ones you should know about. This is an example for creating a token on the Alio blockchain. The name of the program in this case is just token. However, if you're going to create an app from scratch, you will want to give it a unique name as it'll need to be unique to be able to be deployed. So let's first talk about one of the things that makes Alio special, the ability to have private data. Data that's stored on chain, that's encrypted and only the owner of that data can read it. This information will be stored in records. Records store private state. We can describe what a record looks like by defining it in our code, such as this here, and it'll have an owner and an amount. We could expand on the structure to store any kind of state that we might want, and it will all be private. So when we talk about the concept of a token, it's basically a coin built on top of the Alio blockchain, and this coin will need to be minted or created. So let's take a look at a private mint. This will be defined right here in this transition mint private. It initializes a new record with the specified amount of tokens for the receiver. This is an example of a function. It's a transition function, and it will take a receiver, which is of type address, and an amount, which is a U64, which is an integer. And this will return a token. And that's pretty much all it does is it says return token, where the owner is the receiver and the amount is the amount. So an example of how you could use this, we can say Leo account new, and this will give us a private key, a view key, and an address. We can use this address for the receiver on this function call. So a way we might invoke this, and this will all be local, but it'll give you a good idea, will be leo run mint private. And then we can take this address, paste, and then a number of tokens we want to create, such as 10,000, and then u64. Hit enter. And you can see it gives us an output of this structure. This is a record where it has the owner and the amount, which matches this structure exactly. So that's your first example. Now I want to talk about a public mint. This is going to use a transition, but also a finalize. A finalize function will be used when you are working with public state. So this is the code for a public mint. The function mint public issues the specified token amount for the token receiver publicly on the network. And the way it does this is by invoking finalize, which has the same name as the transition. And it basically just passes the receiver and the amount. So the transitions are going to be used by themselves if you're working with purely private state. But if you're going to be doing something with public state, you will have a transition that then invokes a finalize. Public state is done with a mapping so a series of key value pairs. In this case, it's going to be an address 
and a balance. So in this scenario, all the transition does is invoke finalize, and finalize will get the address's current balance and then update it to the current balance plus the new amount being minted. So this get or use, the first argument here is the mapping. Let's take a look at what that looks like. If we scroll up, we have a mapping account, which is an association from an address to a balance, and that will tell us what mapping we are going to use. The next will be the key. And then the third argument here is the default value if that key does not have an associated value. So if the address currently does not have a balance, it'll default to zero and the addition will make sense still. So let's go through a quick example of what it might look like to invoke a public mint. This is still going to take a receiver and an amount. So we'll say Leo run mint public, paste an address and then an amount and we get a response, and that would update that user's balance on chain. Now this is all being done locally for development purposes. If you wanna know more about interacting with a contract on chain, check out my previous workshop video. Now we have a pretty decent idea of how private mints work and public mints work. I want to now talk about transferring tokens. This can be a little interesting because we can have private transfers as well as public transfers, but we can also have private to public transfers, taking a private balance and converting it to public, or the other way around, a public balance converting it to private. So let's take a look at each of those scenarios, and then we'll have a pretty good understanding of this token contract. Let's first look at a fully private transfer. So this is called transfer private. Because we're just working with private state, this is going to be just a transition. It's going to take a token as input, which is a record. So when we invoke a transfer, we have to have an input record. This will ultimately return two new tokens, one for change and the other for the destination, which will be given to the new owner. So consider the case where you might have 100 of a custom token and you send 10 to somebody. The way this is actually going to work is you're going to get 90 as change and 10, which will go to the new owner. That's why we have this calculation in here basically twice, creating two new tokens. So we have the remaining, this is what's going to be sent back to the sender. This is often called change. And the way this is going to work is it's going to take the amount on the input record, subtract the amount being sent, and whatever is left is what's going to be given back to the sender. So that's going to be amount is difference. And it's going to go back to the owner, so it's going to have the same value for owner. Then for transferred, it's going to be the amount being sent, passed in as an argument here, and the owner is going to be the receiver. And we're going to output both of those, the change record and the receiver's record. That's the private transfer. Now let's take a look at a public transfer. As we've seen, we start with a transition called transfer public. This will take the receiver and the amount. We're not working with any private state, so we will just invoke finalize. This will basically do two things. It'll subtract an amount from the sender and increase an amount to the receiver. So if you're sending 100 of some token, it would remove that from one account and add it to the other account. That's pretty much it. Things get a little bit more exciting when you're working with both private and public state, converting from one to the other. Let's take a look at a transfer from private to public. This will be split because part of the effort is done in private and then part of it is done in public. This will create a new token with the difference taking the original input record and subtracting the amount being sent. Then on our call to finalize, we will update the public state, changing the value and the mapping for the receiver adding to it the amount being sent. So this portion deals with the private record, and then this portion deals with the mapping. A transfer from public to private is going to be fairly similar. It's just going to be flipped where we create a new record and then reduce a certain amount on the mapping. So transfer public to private, we do not have an input record. Instead, we just have a receiver address and an amount. We create a new record from this with the destination being the receiver and the amount is the amount being transferred. We don't have any concept of change because it's coming from a public balance. And then in the finalize section, we will just reduce that amount from the sender's balance. So that's a general overview of the different ways of doing transfers, private, public, private to public, and public to private. Now I want to take a moment to talk about structs. Structs allow us to define our own data structure where we can store multiple values in a single variable. 
this is very similar to a record where you can store multiple values as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of structs and how they are different than records. You can see structs used in the tic-tac-toe example. So I'm going to change directory up one from our token and I'll say Leo example tic-tac-toe. And then I open this to code and I'm going to open source main.leo and you can see a struct define right here. You can see it has multiple attributes and then the type here on the right. Think of structs as a general tool to group data together or organize your data in your program, but the difference is that they are not being used to store private state on chain. You could have a record with a struct in it, sure, but the struct is just a general structure to organize different values. A struct can just be any data. And this one, we're just using it to describe a row inside of a board. So we can see we have a struct board, which contains three rows. This is slightly different than the battleship example, which actually uses a record to store the board state instead of just a struct. So in this case, the board state is stored on chain in a record. And here is another scenario from the voting example where we have a record containing a proposal info struct inside of it. And you can see that the record has an owner here. And back in the previous example, it also has an owner for the board state. So the tic-tac-toe example we just initialized is just returning instances of these custom structs. These will not be stored as private state on chain, but instead just the output of a transaction. This tic-tac-toe example is pretty simple. If you want a more complex example that uses a board to play a game, then I would check out the battleship example. But we're going to go through some stuff in the tic-tac-toe to see a little bit more on structs and functions as well. When you see function by itself, this is purely to do some computation or calculate some value. In this case, it's checking for a win. This is not going to output a record. That would be a transition function. These are referred to as helper functions and cannot produce a record. In this case, we take an instance of a board and a number to indicate what player and then check to see if they won. This can be invoked inside of transitions. So if we search for check for win, we can see it down here at the bottom of this make move transition. This will check to see if any of the players won and return the updated board and which player won if they did win. Otherwise, it gives the updated board and a zero for nobody winning. You could use the output of this as the current game state to allow you to decide which move to make next. So we talked a little bit about structs and helper functions. Now I want to talk about arrays. Arrays are a different way of storing multiple values. You're probably familiar with arrays if you've worked with other programming languages. Arrays are static in Leo. We will define the size of the array up front and we won't be able to change the array so they're static in content as well. So if we want to get some practice with arrays, instead of using nested structs for the board, we could just have a 2D array and we'll just store this in the board data attribute and this will be an array and the syntax here will be on the left side of a semicolon what the data looks like, the data type, and then on the right hand side, the count. So we're going to have three rows and each row is going to be an array itself of U8 and three of those. So a row will have three columns and we'll have a total of three of those. Hopefully that makes sense. Now we can go through this and update the code to use our new 2D array for our board. First off, we can create a new board. So the syntax for this, well, I'm just going to pretty much replace this entirely. And we'll say data is an array. And we can define each row in here and then we'll just use zeros. So 0 u8, 0 u8, 0 u8. And we'll just do this for all of these. And then the final row down here. Great, so that creates a new board. Now let's go down into this code to check for a win. I think it would actually make sense to come back to this in a minute because this is going to be called from make move. So let's take a look at make move. For this, we're going to make a bunch of variables to contain the data in a specific spot in the array. So I'll show you how to rewrite this with the array syntax. We use two square brackets, 0u8, 0u8. And we actually need to go into the board.data because it's stored in the data attribute. So you can do that for each one or because we're going to be doing that a lot, we could just create a variable. We'll say let b of type three by three array, and this is going to be assigned board.data. Then we could just down here say B, and then end the line with a semicolon. I'll show you how to do the next one now, and this is zero base, so instead of R1, C2, we'll basically have zero and one, so B, zero, U, eight, 
and one U8. Following this pattern, we could replace all of this to use array code. Then we can update the board being given back. So first thing, we'll assign this to data inside of the board struct and then replace this with a 2D array. So it'll look something like this. And the way this works is basically we can recreate the board using these variables we created. One of these will be updated from the player's move. There might be other ways of designing this, but I'm just trying to change this with as few changes as possible. So basically I have row one, column one, row one, column two, row one, column three, row two, column one, row two, column two, row two, column three. And then finally, row three, column one, row three, column two, and row three, column three. We'll check if the game is over. No syntax errors here, but we will need to check up here in the check for win. So instead of b.r1.c1, we would first create a variable called b. So I'll just call this board and then I'll create a variable let b and again same type here it'll be a two-dimensional array of u8s three by three and this will be board dot data and then instead of r1.c1 we would just use two square brackets the first one being 0u8 and the second one being 0u8 this is going to check for a winner by checking each value across the columns to make up a full row and if they're all the same player, then they win. So for this next one here, it's going to be zero and one. Zero U eight and one U eight. And then finally for here, we will have zero U eight and two U eight. Following this pattern, we can update all of this to use array syntax like so. And that should check all of the different ways to win tic-tac-toe. So that is your introduction to the Leo programming language, getting you started with some of the main pieces of the language. Of course, there is still a lot more you could learn. I would encourage you to work through some of the other examples, such as the battleship example. This video should have helped you get going in the right direction, and now you can use the principles you've learned here to learn new things. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.